Texas midterm primary election day and the polls are open. What you need to know if you still want to cast your ballot coming up. A deadly shooting investigation continues in the medical center why police ended up fighting the victims in different places. That's still ahead. Live from KSA 12, the news at noon starts right now. We are going to start with Russia's war against Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky addressing the European Parliament today, pleading for help as Russian forces move in on major cities. Zelensky accusing Russia of war crimes as strikes reportedly hit shopping malls, residential buildings, and even central squares. But Ukrainian forces are not backing down, putting up a fight as Russia escalates their attacks. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest for us. Explosions rocking Ukraine on yet another day of war. Russia targeting Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv, hitting its central square and civilian administration building with a huge strike. According to Ukrainian officials, killing several and injuring dozens more. Ukrainian President Zelensky saying Russia is committing war crimes by bombarding civilian areas. The Russian military denying those claims. The International Criminal Court says it will open an investigation. Things are changing. Uh, the Russians are not caring anymore about civilian casualties. You look at that impact in the center of Kharkiv, that was a very deliberate action. A senior administration official telling ABC the Russians will crush Ukraine as they seemingly escalate their attacks. Satellite photos show a Russian convoy stretching up to 40 miles long advancing on Kyiv. They continue to, to want to move on Kyiv, to capture Kyiv, to take Kyiv. Um, and uh, although we don't know everything about this convoy, it is certainly in keeping with what we believe to be their intent with, with respect to the capital city. The mayor of Kharkiv saying Russian troops are also now using airstrikes as they face stronger than expected resistance from the Ukrainians on the ground. Ukrainian and Russian negotiators meeting for talks at the Belarusian border Monday, failing to reach a ceasefire. It's unclear if they'll meet again. <laughs> President Zelensky getting emotional as he addressed the European Parliament this morning, pleading for help as he seeks to have Ukraine accepted into the body. And Russia is facing crippling sanctions. They're essentially cut off from the West, and the ruble continues to lose value against the dollar. But the Kremlin is staying defiant, a spokesman saying, go ahead and punish us. We are not scared. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. New at noon, Castroville's police chief could learn his fate later today. There's a special city council meeting scheduled for tonight at 5. Members are set to discuss disciplinary options. This comes after police chief Brian Jackson was accused of using a racial slur several times during a murder investigation. The concern was brought to light by the Medina County Sheriff, who says he heard the inappropriate language on body camera. Casterville City Council previously placed Jackson on administrative leave after an hours-long meeting last week. Well, still no arrest after a shooting on the city's northeast side. Police say just after 12.30 this morning, a man was in his vehicle when someone in another vehicle started shooting at him. This was in the 6700 block of Raintree Forest. That's near Topperwine Road and I-35. Police say a bullet hit the victim in the leg. He was taken to the hospital and should be okay. And last check, officers had not found the person who pulled the trigger. Two men have been shot. One is dead, and police say they have zero suspects. The shootings happened overnight near an apartment complex in the medical center. It was on Fredericksburg Road near Medical Drive. And as Katrina Weber reports, while that is where both victims were shot, police found only one there. Before most people had opened their eyes, San Antonio police were opening up a murder investigation. They got the call around 1.30 this morning about a shooting in the 5500 block of Fredericksburg Road, a parking lot near the Forest Ridge Apartments. Within seconds, police knew the reports were accurate, that two people had been shot. They found a 28-year-old man with a gunshot wound in his head. He was loaded into an ambulance for a trip to a hospital. The other victim, at first, was nowhere to be found. While police found evidence of that second shooting victim here, they didn't find the victim himself here. Somehow he went to the hospital in a private car. And police say he was suffering from a gunshot wound in his neck. Investigators stayed at the scene for hours, trying to collect whatever information and evidence that they could in a case that had become a murder. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed the death of one man. Police say it was the man who they found at the scene, the one who was shot in the head. They still don't know who pulled the trigger or why. The shooter got away.
Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. It is election day and the polls are open. If you need a ride, VIA offering free lifts today. All you need to do is show your valid voter registration card to the bus or van driver today. And they'll take you to the polling location you need to go to anywhere around the city. We have more information online at KSAT.com for you. Texas midterm primary election day is in full swing with polls opening at 7 this morning. Voters will pick their nominees for governor, attorney general, congressional seats and much more. I spoke with voters who casted their ballots early this morning about why they chose to get out and vote. You can't complain if you don't come out and vote. Your vote makes a difference regardless. Just get out and vote. It was a message from Bear County voters this morning who arrived early to cast their ballots at Lions Field polling location off of Broadway. Cindy Cuevas arrived before the polls even opened at 7 a.m. with her best friend, who says when you have a voting buddy, you can keep each other accountable. If we don't vote together, we're constantly reminding each other, like, oh, when is voting day? We need to make sure to make it a point to get out. Ron Greenberg was a second person in line to vote at Lions Field this morning. He says just because it's a primary midterm election doesn't mean it's not an important one. Presidential is one thing, but this is a state election. We've got two big choices. I mean, we had two choices for governor, big choices uh, between Democrat and Republican. And uh, we would change the state dramatically if, you know, depending on how it goes. Cueva says the recent invasion of Ukraine and watching the emotional situation of people having to flee their home country and fight for their freedom made her appreciate her right to vote even more. I thought about um, everything that's happening and the Ukraine where people like don't have rights right now and we're really blessed to be able to like have decisions that make a difference. And we will be online following these races when the polls close at 7 tonight. It's all part of our series, The Breakdown. It's going to be hosted by Myra Arthur and Steve Spreester tonight. We will bring you the results as they roll in, speak live with major candidates, and have our power panel of election an analysis. It starts at 7 p.m. on KSAT.com and on our apps. Then tune in to the night beat and, of course, GMSA tomorrow morning for the latest results. CPS Energy customers can expect higher bills. The first of several planned rate increases go into effect today. A rate increase of 3.85% will go into effect today as the utility is planning more rate hikes over the next five years. CPS Energy officials say that the rate increase will add an additional $3.84 to the average residential customer's monthly bill. In addition, there will be an average increase of $1.26 per month in the fuel adjustment portion of the customer's bill. CPS Energy says it's planning more rate hikes over the next five years. Lots of sun for Election Day. Beautiful day. We've got some great weather ahead and some rain chances too coming up by the weekend. We'll take a look coming up. And Cowboys owner Jerry Jones talking for the first time since word got out about a settlement with cheerleaders coming up in sports. Heart disease is a major concern for many women and men across the country, but there are preventative measures you can take in order to stay healthy. Max Massey takes a look after the break. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women across the country. In the U.S., someone has a heart attack every 40 seconds, and the Alamo City is no stranger to these problems. But as Max Massey shows us, there are preventative measures you can take and tests that should be done before it's too late. My mom has heart disease. My grandmother has heart disease. So I had decided to go and see a cardiologist with my primary doctor's suggestion. Meet Michelle. She was seemingly healthy, no symptoms, but because of her family history, she went to the doctor and she went through the heart health tests. And it's a good thing she did. At that point, I had to have a stent put in, but I didn't even know that I was in trouble. Um, my husband actually had a stent the year before me. Now he was an active runner, would run a mile a day, exercise every day. The last couple of years, the pandemic has caused more and more obstacles for people trying to see their doctors and get diagnosed with heart issues. Now we are seeing a big wave of people surfacing after these years of not taking care of themselves. Huge problem because unfortunately heart disease affects every age groups in different ways. Heart health, a big issue around the country and around San Antonio, and it is never too early to get checked out.
It's never too early for screening. Um, some people who know about their family history of heart disease, they start screening their kids. As for Michelle, she is happy and healthy and she has a message for our community. It's better to be safe than sorry because had I waited, I would not be here today. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Let's get outside with live cam. This is one of those days where you, you might want to go outside and have uh, lunch on the porch or at a restaurant on the... It, uh, was, it was so cold early this morning. I had like a beanie like on, and now it's beautiful, Justin. Now it's perfect. These are the kind of days we just love. I mean, temperature's going to be around 70 this afternoon. Sunny skies, not a lot of wind. It's perfect. Perfect weather. Uh, the aquifer is down three tenths of a foot to 661.6. That's a little concerning. We're starting to get close to that 660 mark. We need some rain. There is a little bit in the forecast. In the pollen count, it's molds and oak. They're both low, but it is notable that oak showed up today. We're headed into oak season. We'll keep you posted there. Your forecast straight ahead. Yeah, we've been enjoying the sunshine and the warmth, but as he said, we can start worrying about a little bit of water on the grass out there because we're going to have some uh, we're going to have some problems if we don't. Get my some rain. my grass is just I mean it it's just dead, <laughs> and I I actually watered it for about five minutes with the sprinkler yesterday, Justin. Yeah. I don't know if it helped at all. <laughs> it's probably just dormant. It, it, mm -hmm. It'll turn green eventually, but we do need some rain. We really do. You guys are right about that. And how do we feel about the month of March? You guys good with it? It's a good month, right? I'm, I'm just happy we're done with the swirly February <laughs> and we're on to March, which hopefully uh, is more yes. spring-ish. Good more thunderstorm spring -ish. in March would be nice. Yes, uh, well, good downpour. We don't want severe weather, but good downpour. I agree with you. Let's look at the uh, climatology for the month of March. We start off with temperatures averaging about 70 degrees for a high, average low is 48. By the time we get to the end of the month, we average 77 for a high, average low is 55. So we're starting to see those numbers really climb. Our hottest temperature we've ever seen, 100. That was back in 1991 and 1971. We can go as low as 19. That was set back in 1980 and 2002. March highlights. Well, we gained 53 minutes of daylight throughout the month. And then uh, daylight saving time, of course, begins March 13th. The spring equinox is March 20th. So a lot to look forward to here in the month of March. And yes, we could see some thunderstorms. There are actually a few in the forecast. and We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But first, Temperatures this morning down to 33 here in San Antonio. It was a cold start. Several spots did get below freezing. Randolph, Port S.A., Hondo, Bernie Stage, up to Kerrville's 26 there. New Braunfels down to 32. Uh, as we look uh, wider view here, we can see uh, Beville even got down to 32. So it was a chilly morning for a lot of us, but temperatures have now really warmed up. 64 degrees at the airport, 68 Stinson, 65 Kelly, 65 in Randolph. And you'll see some 70s popping up on the map here very, very soon. 61 Canyon Lake, 65 in New Braunfels. You're sitting at 63 in Uvalde, 66 right now in Del Rio. Primary elections today, if you're heading out, there are, uh, well, good weather. That, that's the bottom line here. Forecast by noontime, 67 by 2 p.m., 71 by 4 p.m. will be uh, up around 71 degrees. And then the, this evening down to 64. Good looking forecast if, if you plan to be out and about doing anything today, whether it be voting or just being outside. Dew points are gonna uh, continue to climb. Now, right now they're still pretty low. The air's still pretty dry, but by tomorrow you'll see these numbers jump up. And then by the weekend, you'll start to feel the humidity a little bit. I, I think there'll be enough humidity even starting Thursday that we'll start to get some morning fog, maybe some morning clouds, and then probably some drizzle over the weekend. You know, that kind of, kind of pattern that we tend to get in around here, and then some afternoon sun. Uh, as we look at the uh, satellite picture here, there are some thin high clouds that are trying to work in from the west. They haven't had a whole lot of success. We may see a few of these a little bit later today, but it is not gonna be a big deal. Should make for uh, a nice sunset this evening, if anything. And as we look at the big picture here, it is rather quiet across the southern tier of states. All the action's way up there to the north. Some rain and snow up across the Great Lakes, but uh, nothing down here. And I think it stays quiet for a couple of days. Then the pattern starts to change a little bit as we get later in the week. We got a trough developing out west. That brings some active weather in. And then we get a frontal boundary. This may bring some storms as early as Sunday. Now, I don't think we see a whole lot down here, but there could be an isolated shower or storm Sunday afternoon. When the front comes through, uh, looks like that'll happen early Monday. We could get some showers and storms with the front itself and then maybe a little bit of activity behind it as well. In general, it'll be unsettled along this front and there could be some spring like thunderstorms 
probably not here, probably to our east and northeast, but we'll keep you posted. Here's the extended forecast. 74 Wednesday, Thursday, 76 Friday, and then some 80s in the forecast Saturday and Sunday. Rain chances right now, we're going to go 20% Sunday, 30% chance on Monday. And it does cool down to start next week with a high of 67 on Monday, guys. Thank you, Justin. I like your, uh, your little voting booth there. You like that? That was cute. Yeah, pretty cool. Hey, the Spurs in their rodeo road trip in Memphis last night. They left the building without a win. Art Morales decided to leave Grambling right after he got hired. We'll tell you why coming up. Talks inside Major League Baseball continue. Officials with MLB decided to extend the self-imposed deadline in an attempt to reach a labor deal agreement with the Players Association. According to MLB.com, some progress has been made between the two sides, and the hope now is to get something done by 5 p.m. today. If so, opening day could take place on its originally scheduled date of March 31st. Spring training games through early March already been canceled. Professional baseball hadn't seen a work stoppage since the 94-95 season. Last month, MLB Commissioner Rob Manfield said missing games would be, quote, disastrous. Hey, San Antonio Spurs finally got to dismount off that rodeo road trip after a trip to Memphis last night. It was another chance to make history for head coach Greg Popovich, who's a win away from tying Don Nelson for the most victories in the NBA history. Spurs off to another quick start. Doug McDermott to three. 15-9 Spurs, but the Grizz take control. Steven Adams in the paint, finishes with the slam. Memphis up 42-34 after one second quarter. DeJounte keeps the Spurs in it, spinning and hitting. A two-point game. Spurs down 54-52, but Memphis ends the quarter on fire after a Murray hits the free throw. Adams chunks it down court. John Morant in the air, grabs, shoots, scores with .4 on the clock. And so that's a legal. Wow, that just rubbed salt in the wound. The clock reminded Spur fans of Derek Fisher's infamy. Yeah, okay. 2004 playoffs. Spurs head into halftime trailing 68-58. All right, let's go to the fourth quarter now. Spurs still managing to stay close. Yaka Pertle finds Lonnie Walker the fourth for the lay-in. Nice pass, nice shot. 22 points for Lonnie, but there was no stopping Morant. He set a Grizzlies franchise record with 52 points. Memphis beats the Spurs 118-105. Tonight I was disappointed because we gave up 42 in the first quarter. So mentally weren't there, you know, was it three games and four nights and the last two that were you know, pretty much drained them? Probably a little bit, but I don't care. You know, they can't have that excuse. Uh, but the start of the game was really poor. And we got back in it, you know, like they always do. It was a four point game and then the game went away from us after that. So they, they hung in and gave it everything they did. All right, so next up for the Spurs, get a couple of days to rest. They take on the Sacramento Kings here at home. First home game in a while, but it's only one, and they're back out on the road. But that one is Thursday at 7.30 at the AT&T Center. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. For the first time since a near $2.5 million settlement was revealed for four Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, team owner Jerry Jones is talking. This is the first time Jones has spoken about the incident in 2015 that involved Cowboys Executive Vice President for Communications and Public Relations, Rich Dalrymple. He abruptly retired earlier this month, or actually earlier last month. Dalrymple was accused of entering a room where four cheerleaders were changing during the Cowboys kickoff luncheon in 2015. One of the cheerleaders identified Dalrymple, claiming he was holding a cell phone pointed in their direction, standing behind a barrier. Earlier that year, Dalrymple was accused of by a fan of watching a live stream of the Cowboys draft day war room and taking upskirt photos of Charlotte Jones Anderson, the daughter of Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, which he denied. Here is what Jones told Dallas television station KXAS in part. We took these allegations very seriously. We immediately began to look, see an investigation into the situation. I can assure you that had we found that it need be, there would have been firings or there would have been suspensions. As it turns out, in the best interest of our cheerleaders, in the best interest of the organization, in the best interest of our fans, what we decided to do was show the cheerleaders how seriously we took these allegations and we wanted them to know that we were serious and so the settlement was the way to go. Grambling State head coach Hugh Jackson's decision to hire Art Bryles as his offensive coordinator has already been reversed. Jackson, the former head coach of the Cleveland Browns, took over at Grambling State in December and tried giving Bryles a second chance at college football. But since the announcement of Bryles hiring, the school has come under heavy criticism. It was supposed to be Bryles' 
job, first job in college football since he was fired by Baylor back in 2016 following an independent investigation into numerous sexual assaults against the football program. Those were allegations, but ESPN's Pete Thamel broke the news this afternoon that Browse was officially out. ESPN obtained a statement from Browse, and here's what it says in part. Unfortunately, I feel my continued presence will be a distraction to you and your team, which is the last thing that I want. I have the utmost respect for the university and your players. And in the meantime, just, just breaking, Dak Prescott has had surgery on his non-throwing soldier. He had it last week. He is expected to be available for Cowboys off-season program. So once again, Dak with surgery on the non-throwing soldiers. That's according to ESPN. So that just came over a few minutes ago. Hope he there has enough go. recovery time. Ah, I think he will. I think he has the best trainers, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, women have been leaving the workforce in record numbers since the start of the pandemic. Why, why they're choosing to take career breaks instead of vacations, that's coming up in the next half hour. And tech giants are cracking down on Russia state media after pressure from European officials. A look at the changes being made after the break. President Biden getting ready to deliver his first State of the Union address tonight, and it comes at a crucial time in his presidency. The war in Ukraine looming large as the pandemic enters its third year amid high inflation and sacking poll numbers. The president is expected to address those issues. The White House also says he'll urge Congress to pass what they're calling the unity agenda, comprising of historically bipartisan proposals. ABC's M. Wynn is in Washington with more. President Biden will deliver his first State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress tonight. Poised to overshadow his speech, Russia's ongoing invasion into Ukraine. As attacks escalate near the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv, President Biden will call on the free world to support uplifting the core value of democracy. This is a battle between the, the utility of democracies in the 21st century and autocracies. If you notice, you don't have Russia talking about communism anymore. It's about an autocracy. That's what's at stake here. We got to prove democracy works. The economy will also take center stage, especially as gas prices and high inflation hamper the president's popularity. As Biden's approval rating slumped to 37 percent, according to a recent ABC News Washington Post poll, he's expected to lay out ways to improve the economy, including strengthening the supply chain and promoting competition to lower costs for families. He's going to make clear uh, that one of the best ways uh, to lower costs over the long run is to, con is to increase the productive capacity of our economy. The president also aiming to turn the page on COVID-19 as restrictions ease. This says the Capitol and the White House lifts its mask requirements this week. And security around the Capitol is tight. Fencing is back up ahead of tonight's speech and over concerns of potentially disruptive trucker convoys making their way to the Capitol. Meantime, in a show of solidarity, several members of Congress say they will wear blue and yellow tonight, the national colors of Ukraine. M. Wynn, ABC News, Capitol Hill. Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube all say they're cracking down on Russian state media content on their platforms. Facebook's parent company, Meta, is blocking access to RT and Sputnik across the European Union. Twitter is reducing the visibility and labeling tweets that link to state media organizations in Russia. Meanwhile, over the weekend, YouTube announced it is blocking Russian state media with Ukraine. It is also tweaking the, its algorithm to limit recommendations to those channels. European officials have been pressuring social media platforms to address pro-Russia propaganda, but there are concerns that these restrictions could also stifle opposition and independent voices within Russia. Jury selection continues today in the first trial for one of the hundreds of former President Donald Trump supporters charged with storming the U.S. Capitol last year. Guy Rafat, a Texas man, is facing five charges. Prosecutors say he brought a gun to the insurrection, battled police, and threatened his children to keep quiet when he returned home to Texas after the attack. Federal prosecutors questioned 34 potential jurors yesterday. Some potential jurors were dismissed because of how strongly they felt about the attack. The trial is expected to last more than a week. Outside with live cam. Bottom line is it's a beautiful day, but we need some rain. Yes. Pretty much sums it up. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I do it, enjoy the sun, though. I do, too. And it just 
for some reason feels like March. You know, we're only March 1st, but somehow the change in the weather from February to March, it just feels more spring-like so, out there. You feel like March? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it did. Maybe it's all in my head. It's possible. <laughs> it's practice, uh, March. <laughs> let's take a look at the, the satellite picture across the state. Some high clouds drifting through west Texas. We're seeing some of those try to work in our direction, but we're not going to see much. Uh, if we see anything today, it'll be some thin, serious clouds. No big deal. Uh, we'll see plenty of sun. Temperatures across the state, it's nice everywhere, just like it is here. 66 in Del Rio, 68 in Marfa, 61 in El Paso, 63 in Amarillo, 68 in Dallas. Looks good uh, across the entire Lone Star State. And uh, here's what to expect the next few days. We're going to see those temperatures get up into the 70s today with mostly sunny skies. More humidity and fog heads our way by the time we get towards the end of the work week. Uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you'll notice some morning clouds, maybe some morning a drizzle and some fog here and there at the weekend. It is going to be warm and humid, but the big question is, will we see a few storms on Sunday and a cold front? When does that move through and does it bring rain for us next week? We'll take a look at those possibilities coming up here in just a few minutes. Guys, thank you, Justin. A new study suggesting that the effectiveness of Pfizer's children's vaccine was less effective in kids than in teens and adults. The study was done in New York and experts say the results could be because children ages 5 to 11 received a dose that is one third the dose for children 12 and older. The study was also done during the Omicron wave when there were a tremendous amount of breakthrough infections in adults and children. We have to be careful about not overinterpreting these results. They are one time point in one location. Overall, what we see is these vaccines are working incredibly well to protect kids from hospitalization and death, no matter what age group. And the vaccine still dramatically reduces the risk of hospitalization among children. The CDC told a BC News quote, Pfizer and Moderna's COVID-19 vaccines continue to offer high levels of protection against severe illness, hospitalization and deaths in all age groups, end quote. Well, as COVID-19's latest variant is in retreat, the nation looks ahead to some sense of normalcy. We're getting a deeper sense of how the pandemic jolted a system that was already hanging on by a thread. Thousands of children entered foster care during the pandemic, but many agencies are struggling to find families to care for the children and teens. ABC's Morgan Norwood shows us how advocates are supporting foster families, helping young adults transition into life after the foster system and encouraging Americans to consider opening their homes. The crippling effect of COVID-19 has impacted some of America's most vulnerable children, those in foster care. They have experienced um, disruption from their daily life, the school that they attend, the, you know, their rhythms and routines, and now they have the pandemic on top of all of that. Jeannie Emilio heads up a Spiranet, a California nonprofit dedicated to foster care and adoption support. She says finding homes for children at any age has become more difficult. There definitely is a demand for foster parents. A Spiranet says the demand they're seeing isn't coming from an influx of children. It's the financial and emotional hardship that foster families are experiencing because of the pandemic. We've seen families decide to take breaks. We've seen them need to reduce the number of children they can care for. Chloe Calder is a single foster and adoptive mother of three children, all under the age of six. During the pandemic, she says she struggled. I felt an immense amount of stress. Like it was May when I had the three kids just come. We had about three weeks where I just pushed through. Much of that anxiety, Calder says, was fueled by the pressure to shield her kids from getting sick. I felt you know, I need to protect myself and the kids the best I can. And that has been very difficult. Calder eventually left her teaching job to better care for the children. The sacrifice, though difficult, one she doesn't regret. The kids didn't choose this life, so they deserve someone who's gonna give them their all. Chloe has plans to adopt her youngest child that she's caring for, but even that process has slowed to a crawl because of the pandemic. Kids' cases are moving slower, so they are in care longer. Virtual court dates are being overwhelmed with um, review cases that are from 2021 that are spilling over into this year. And that's why advocates say they need help. If this is something you've been thinking about for a while, um, take that next step. Learn more. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. Still coming up, some people opted to take a career break during the pandemic, and they may be looking to get back into the workforce. What employers want to know about those breaks? 
A new smartphone comes equipped with a feature that could help those trying to keep indigenous languages from disappearing. Details coming up. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Tesla is one step closer to opening its new German Gigafactory later this month. Reports stated that the EV giant is close to receiving approval to begin production at the factory. The news sent shares storing on the day. Most tech stocks were relatively flat on the day. Lucid and Lordstown Motors are both cutting their vehicle production forecast for the rest of the year. The news caused shares to plummet as both companies fail to live up to their production promises. The EV newcomer is blaming supply chain constraints for the slash in vehicle expectations. And Chevron is buying biodiesel maker Renewable Energy Group for $3.15 billion. The purchase marks a premium of more than 40 percent of renewables Friday close. It comes as major oil companies are taking heat from lawmakers and investors to cut back on their carbon footprint amid intensifying climate change. And that's your Cheddar News and Tech Update. I'm Ariel Hickson from Washington, D.C. Can smartphones help save indigenous languages? Probably not, but one company is hoping to at least get younger people interested. Motorola has introduced a Cherokee language interface on its newest line of phones. New phone users will be able to find apps and toggle settings using the syllable-based written language. First created by the Cherokee Nation Sequoia in the early 1800s, it will appear on the company's high-end Edge Plus phones when they go on sale in the spring. It's not the first time consumer technology has embraced the language as Apple, Microsoft and Google already enable people to configure their laptops and phones so that they can type in Cherokee. Well, we could all use a little vacation. It helps us reset and unwind. However, some people around the country went a little further by taking a full on career break during the pandemic. Now, some folks may be looking to head back to the office. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has the details on how you can re-enter the workforce after that hiatus. When mom of two, Emma McCulloch, decided to re-enter the workforce after six years away, she was a little nervous. I did feel a little bit embarrassed about that career break and uh, how to classify it on my resume. But Emma was able to show potential employers that her time away, especially caring for her son Christopher, born with cerebral palsy, made her a better employee. I certainly learned a lot of research skills to identify the therapies and the resources for my children. And in my role as a manager, I'm much more empathetic because of the experiences I had during my career break. Nice. Women have been leaving the workforce in record numbers since the start of the pandemic and haven't been returning as quickly. They've suddenly had to juggle not having childcare. And what we actually found is that one in three women are doing five plus additional hours of housework each day due to the pandemic. Many companies are making an effort to bring women back to the workforce, including IBM, General Motors and JP Morgan offering career re-entry and mentorship programs. And now LinkedIn is offering a new feature called Career Breaks, giving users the ability to show potential employers why they left the workforce and help navigate their return. If you can find those companies that are really doubling down, they're likely a better fit. That was ABC's Rebecca Jarvis reporting. And if you're hesitant about using that LinkedIn feature, employers say they don't want to know any potential career breaks. 51% said they are more likely to contact a candidate that provides context. Justin, I'm very excited that we are done with February, which was super up and down and squirrely. And now it's feeling like spring, even though it's only March 1st. It does feel like spring, although I'll warn you that March can have some ups and downs no, itself. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> But this week, this week looks great. So far, we've gained about 30 degrees from our morning low, 33. We're up to 64 now. The records go way back into the record books. 89 is record high set back in 1899. And we go back even further for the record low, 21 set back in 1890. We'll talk about this great weather and some changes ahead by the weekend coming up.
We were just talking about the first week of spring break is next week yep. for a lot of school districts. Uh, I know, and I and it, early? ISD, it, it feels early. It does. I know, SEISD, wow. a lot of the big districts have spring break. So Are your it's... kids on spring break next week? Mm -hmm. All yeah. on you, buddy. Yeah, so Good luck. Whoa, you is put, it going to play nice? Yeah, well, <laughs> spring break, so you so know much pressure. pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just coming Sorry. from every every person. Um, anyway, <laughs> Sorry, Justin. We love you. It's okay. Uh, let's look at the oak season. If uh, if you're not a fan, which we really aren't, right? Everything turns yellow as we get into April. Now things are starting to kick in here. Uh, we saw oak show up for the first time today. Granted, it was at 10, but this is the time of year where we may start to see a little bit of oak in the pollen counts and then eventually by mid-April that's when we tend to peak but if you want to learn more about it meteorologist Sarah Spivey wrote a great article on our website ksat.com check it out it talks about oak season kicking and in fact I think we just got a push alert about it if you got a ksat app you can read all about it temperatures across the country right now really pretty comfortable 68 Dallas 69 Wichita 59 Omaha a lot of warm air is shifted north now there's a boundary here so north of that it's a little chillier 48 chicago 47 cleveland in one of the cold spots as it normally is 22 international falls coldest actually caribou maine it's at 15. uh the cold air really is going to stay bottled up to the north and we're going to continue to see some pretty nice weather the next couple days take a look at this time lapse this was a beautiful sunrise we've had a few clouds move across the sky today but not many and uh, right now we're looking at 64. Dew point is at 25, so that's one of the reasons we'll see a big swing in temperatures today from that morning low, which was chilly, to a very, very nice afternoon high. Southwesterly winds around 5 right now. It is, uh, as far as any cloud cover goes, it's been all off to our north, some thin cirrus, if that. So I don't know that we're going to see much in the way of cloud cover at all today. 70 Pleasanton, 65 Hondo, 66 in Kerrville, 65 in New Braunfels, 68 in LaGrange. And the forecast temperatures, well, we should get up to about 71 or so here in town. Gonzales 68, Howlettsville 68. If you're watching from Lakey today, 69, your forecast high. And a little warmer in Eagle Pass, 75 degrees there. Tonight, temperatures drop down into the 40s, low 40s, 42, San Antonio, maybe a degree or two cooler than that. And there will be some spots that dip into the 30s tonight and then back into the mid 70s by 4 p.m. tomorrow. So a little bit warmer on your Wednesday still with a lot of sun and the dry air is still here. It has felt really dry outside. Now this starts to change too as we head later into the week. You'll see these dew points gradually start to rise and eventually it'll feel kind of muggy out there. I think that probably happens by into the work week and into the weekend. We see dew points get into the 50s and 60s. Now the hope is that with that moisture in place with the front coming through late on Sunday, we'll get some rain. Maybe a couple of thunderstorms too. We could use any rain we can get right now as the drought conditions continue to settle in here. In the meantime, it is quiet. There is no rain to speak of the next couple of days. That's going to hold off until Sunday when this uh, front starts to move in. We get a little bit of upper level energy, maybe a couple of isolated thunderstorms Sunday evening. So rain chances aren't great. I think the bulk of the energy is going to be to our north. And then as the front comes through, there's a window there for some rain and maybe some rain behind the front too on Wednesday. In general, a pretty unsettled pattern as we get into the first part of next week. Uh, as we look at the forecast here, 74 tomorrow, 74 Thursday, some morning fog. Some morning fog and drizzle Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So keep in mind it'll be a little bit gray to start with some afternoon sun. And then we've got rain chances Sunday and Monday. We'll be right back. Hey, want to get you outside to I-35 at Bampsey. You're looking at a wreck that just happened just a, a few minutes ago. Matter of fact, Justin was in the middle of his weather cast when, when he kind of got a glimpse of this wreck. You can see a pickup truck on the inside concrete median and another vehicle. Looks like another some kind of utility truck on and the median. And then there's like, a couple of cars behind him. Yeah, it looks so. like first responders just arrived. Earlier, I could see an ambulance driving up. People have gotten out to help that driver. Hopefully the situation is OK and that driver is not injured, but we don't know at this time. But you can see that lane backed up now to yep. one lane that the first responders are there. So we'll just keep an eye on it on air and online when we get those updates. A lot of folks getting off on that access road as well. So if you headed that direction, once again, that is at I-35 at Bampsey. So be careful if you're going to get in your car and head that way, you might want to find an alternate route. It is the day to indulge in SA Live, always on SA Live, <laughs> celebrating Indulging Mardi what? Gras with Creole cooking, cocktails and cookies. Really? I forgot today is Fat Tuesday and Mike yes. and Fiona. Laissez les bon temps rouler. Yes, let the good times 
Central, and you can get a taste of Louisiana without having to leave the Lone Star State. Yep, Sherry Turner from That's It, That's All, and That Looks Good. What are we <laughs> yes, here today? Yes, yes, yes. We have smoked alligator sausage po' boys. Ooh. Ooh. And it's got a bite to you, it. It's got a bite. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Of course it's <laughs> And once you've had a smoked alligator po' boy, you'll never forget. Ooh. Sounds like a challenge, okay. And then you gotta have something to uh, kinda wash that down. And Taylor Morrow from Walk-Ons is here. And ooh, you, got, you brought the drinks. I did bring new drinks. I have our Southern Smash and our Hard Raspberry Lemonade that are absolutely delicious and extremely delicious. And they also have some $5 drink specials. We're gonna be making those a little bit later on. You got food to go with it too, I right? I do have our Mardi Gras $5 food special, beignets and a cup of gumbo. Ooh, that sounds good. Love beignets. Okay. All right, are you ready for a dessert that is Mardi Gras themed? Yep, Hillary DeVille from Opal and Onyx. And I know there's supposed to be king cakes, but yours kind of shrunk. Yeah, so we've got a cookie version of a king cake. It is our cookie king cake sandwich made with cream cheese icing and strawberry topped just like a regular king cake. Ooh, and some other little goodies to oh, go yes. with that too. So that All a whole right. lot more. When SA Live on... continues in yep. just a few minutes.